Hi, and welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm uh, just going to uh, commence with uh, uh, an opening land acknowledgement. Uh, Ottawa is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the uh, Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation have lived in uh, this, on this territory for millennia, and we all honor them and this land. CHEO also honors all First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples, uh, and their valuable past, present, and future contributions to this land. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speakers. We have three speakers uh, focusing on the area of CBD. Uh, first off will be uh, Sandy C. Sandy is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and uh, an emergency uh, physician. She is Associate Medical Director of Pediatric uh, Emergency uh, Medicine. And uh, she uh, is the competency-based uh, medical education lead in the Department of Pediatrics and also chair of the Accreditation Committee uh, of PGME. Uh, Sandy has also completed uh, the uh, HESP program, the Health Education Scholars Program, in uh, the Department of Innovation and Medical Education at the University of Ottawa and has clearly had a very keen interest in medical education over her entire career uh, and uh, look forward to what uh, Sandy has to uh, inform us about C CBD. She will be joined by uh, Toby Oatson, uh, who is uh, also an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and a, a, a member of the Division of Pediatric Medicine. Uh, she is also the current uh, training program director for the pediatrics program. Uh, Toby also completed the, the uh, HASP program. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to uh, her clinical practice in, in pediatrics, she had trained in, in infectious diseases and uh, in tropical medicine. Uh, but she has a keen interest in uh, medical education. And uh, we look forward to uh, her uh, component of the presentation. And then finally, we'll have uh, Hilary Ryder. Hilary is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and uh, a member of the uh, Division of Pediatric and, uh, Intensive Care. Uh, she is a former training program director in the department. Uh, she clearly has uh, led many important uh, educational initiatives. Uh, over the course of her uh, career here at uh, CHEO and the University of Ottawa. So uh, they are going to uh, collectively address getting higher with CBD. Uh, I hope this is all legal. And uh, uh, I uh, open it up for Sandy to lead us off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining Hillary, Toby and myself on this elevated grand round on the topic of competency-based medical education. Uh, we're going to make it uh, a little bit fun um, in terms of the objectives um, and uh, hope that we can engage you in thinking about CBD in a different way. So we're going to first think about the developmental workplace based assessment um, and the why of that. In medicine, the root cause of everything that we do is related to safe care of patients. To have safe care, we have to optimize the educational learning experience for our residents. Uh, how we foster growth and development is important to their success in the work that they do day after day and how they become the pediatricians of our future. To talk about educational development medicine, I want to first take a look at this through a slightly different lens. Recently on CBC radio, a story popped up about an American author who traveled to various parts of the world observing how children are raised. As part of this story, uh, she described children in the Yucatan being taught at a very early age to help with household duties. For instance, a two-year-old helps with the laundry by pouring water on the clothes. And as they get older, they're given the responsibility to take the clothes down to the river to wash. Child development is CBD. We allow them to do everything in stages. And if they jump too far ahead without close supervision, the safety implications and expectations of what can happen can sometimes be quite alarming. As pediatricians, we advocate for safe sequencing of activities to develop the next life skill. As teachers, we need to be mindful of these same developmental stages in our educational programming. 
to know whether a trainee is ready. We need to assess them properly based on knowing where they are in their stage of training. We are not alone in this. Other industries use workplace-based assessments to ensure competence of performance and public safety. You'll be happy to know that airline pilots have standards in flight literacy. As you can see in their training manual, the instructor teaches flight management and maneuvers by demonstration, then allows the student to practice under direction, and finally evaluates accomplishments by observing the performance. Assessment is based on established standards of performance, as well as to the student's stage of development as a pilot. An assessment on ability is demonstrated by consistent proficiency over a number of flight maneuver performances. Starting to sound familiar. Medical education itself has gone through its own developmental stages. So William Osler was the first to bring medical students out of the lecture hall for bedside clinical training. By the 1960s, Studies found bedside teaching and direct observation of the learner occurred in 75% of patient encounters. In 2009, Gonzalo reported that directly observed bedside teaching occurred in only 25% of precepted patients. Additionally, reports from learners in the study showed that less than one physical diagnostic skill was taught or reviewed per day for half of the learners in a large academic teaching hospital. A report by uh, Abraham Flexner in 1910 set a path for medical education to be based on physiology and biochemistry. A new model was also promoted for small group learning, individual development, and more hands-on approach to education. A 2013 observational study by Stickrath reported that medical teams taught history taking skills in only 4.2% of patient encounters and physical exam skills in only 14%. Percentage of time spent on educational activities relating to direct patient care declined from 29% in 1990 to only 9% in 2013. Going back as far as 1978, this WHO report discussed the observed and proposed development of medical curriculum. A subject-centered curriculum describes the process where all students study the same material in the same setting in the same time frame, and we assume that they learn in the same manner and at the same rate. Change is seen mostly in textbooks and does not bring medical education closer to the work of practicing physicians. An integrated curriculum attempts to organize teaching around major organ systems, providing context for learning, bringing the experience of medical education closer to the work of medical practitioners. A proposed competency-based curriculum has the intended output of a health professional who can correctly perform numerous clinical tasks that requires knowledge of physical and biological sciences and comprehends the social and cultural factors that influence patient care and well being. Oli Tankate further reported that competency should be specific, comprehensive, durable, trainable, measurable, and related to professional activities. Competencies can also be progressive in their achievement. In 2007, he described the wave of educational bodies adopting a new concept of competency. National postgraduate governing bodies included the Canadian Royal College, the ACGME in the US, the General Medical Council of the UK, and Netherlands Central College of Medical Specialties. This brings us to these articles from 2010. The Lancet Commission report below describes the future for global health professional education. In it, it looked at what came before and what would serve the needs of the future. As you can see, we've moved from apprenticeship through the subject-centered scientific curriculum into our current problem-based integrated curriculum. The next step is competency-driven education that supports a local and global health system. Traditional curriculums change slowly to accommodate new information and have a tendency not to be re-examined. As discussed before, the established curriculum drives the learning rather than the learning objectives driving the curriculum. Competency-based training attempts to turn this on its head, focusing on the outcomes of education as a driving force and measuring levels of achievement using workplace-based assessments to demonstrate progress or shortcomings in the achievement of the end goal. 
I'm going to let Hillary take you through a comparison of how we've been functioning in the traditional curriculum and what it might look like to move forward in CBME. Thanks, Sandy. Good morning, everybody. I'm sure we all sometimes feel like we're in evaluation jail, weighed down by the burdens of evaluations, and perhaps we're worried about what's going to happen with the new curriculum. I'd like you to view the next few minutes as an opportunity to think about how we can assess, evaluate, and provide feedback to our learners with our new curriculum. We, we are, however, guilty of several misdemeanors at the moment. As you can see, these three mugs have committed a crime. Which one of them has a full inbox that looks like the next slide? Well, as you can see, Toby is probably representative of many of the rest of us with overflowing 145 inboxes and multiple evaluations still outstanding to perform. But she's able to get out of evaluation jail free using the following nifty app from Elentra. This is an app that you can all download on your phone and you can therefore fill out an assessment for a resident in real time at the bedside following an activity, it takes just a few minutes. I'm a Luddite, if I can download the app and get it to work, then anybody can. How long should the assessments take? Well, our neurosurgery colleagues surveyed uh, the nationwide neurosurgery faculty uh, as they moved forward to competency-based education to ask how long it should take to complete an assessment provide feedback for an assessment, and whether or not apps were the best means of completion. As you can see, the neurosurgeons stated three minutes was the ideal time to complete, five minutes the ideal time for provision of feedback, and they demonstrated a significant preference for app-facilitated completion over a URL to click in an email or a website. Now, those were neurosurgeons, so I think that as pediatricians, we could probably take an overall 10 minutes. If you're not familiar with Elentra, remember that pediatrics is actually a fairly late addition to the world of CBD. Many of our pediatric subspecialty programs and many other residency programs at CHEO have already transitioned. So if you need some help with Elentra, by all means, use those people as resources. It's not only faculty who are guilty of crimes. As you can see, we've got three of our suspect residents here, one of which is a high stakes gambler. Next slide, Tim. So Jared is once again only representative of his resident crew. And no, he is not going to Vegas with his group to count cards. He actually is one of a large group of residents who have a resident-led initiative called dun, 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 the CBD Challenge. So this starts next week, May the 10th. Uh, and uh, what it is, is faculty being matched with groups of residents and how many EPAs, Entrustable Professional Activity Evaluations, can each group complete? And we're hoping that this will be successful as a pilot and then we can continue it moving forward into CBD. This is an example of an incentive. Next slide, please, Sandy. It's one of the solutions proposed by this group of prominent medical educators who wanted to address some of the concerns that we all know are present regarding the implementation of competency-based medical education. This group identified three possible problems in the implementation. They're listed below, conceptual, psychometric, and logistical, following a systematic review of the literature. For the logistical solutions, one of the main solutions proposed was incentives, things such as awards. The award for the CBD challenge is bragging rights, I think. The American Board of Medical Education has a module in clinical supervision that one can complete merely by filling out assessments. The AMA Council on Medical Education provides faculty with credit for the learning they get associated with teaching and also a physician's recognition award, award for preparing to provide EPA assessments. Another incentive just 
going back to the Elentra that I mentioned, is technology, as in applications. Next slide. Which one of these mugs embellishes evaluations as the next slide demonstrates? So as you can see, this person for 10 procedures that are listed here, always places on their evaluations of residents that they consistently meet this standard. That is of course, me, myself and I, uh, and this highlights the problem with direct observation of resident skills. You've heard a little bit about this from Sandy, but here's an example from our pediatric colleagues at Dalhousie University and the IWK. They surveyed faculty and residents to look at how often observations were being done in the inpatient and outpatient environment. And here are the results. So faculty stated that they observed residents the following numbers of times for these three tasks over a four week period. As you can see, not very many. Residents on the other hand, actually did report being observed a little bit more often when delivering a plan, but still for observation of history and physical, uh, really not very much observation at all. There's really a dearth of literature on uh, examining for procedural skills, but suffice to say that the old adage of see one, do one, teach one, or maybe do one, teach one, is actually still alive and well. So how can we improve? In the paper that I quoted, the suggestions were to schedule an assessment at the start of the rotation, to use better tools for assessment. These are the EPAs that we have coming to us in July and that residents should ask to be observed. And the new curriculum will help further with observation as well. Because we can now we now have two entrustable professional activity procedural EPAs, one in foundations and one in the core stage of training. These cover 18 procedures and the resident requires several assessments per procedure that are delineated in the EPA. And so we'll be far more certain of the competence of our residents to perform these procedures. And we are very lucky to have a thriving simulation program at CHEO, which will be one of the main, main ways in which we can assess procedures. The current set of procedures is not informed actually by the data that's outlined in this paper. Just wanted to send a shout out to Dr. Rowan Legg and two of our excellent prior residents, Jess White and Ronish Gupta, for administering a survey through the CPSP, a one-time survey that has given us a massive amount of data about what procedures Canadian pediatricians really do. And we're hoping that as time moves forward and the CBD curriculum gets revised, that we'll be able to adapt the procedural EPAs accordingly. Now, all of these three residents, oh, Oh my goodness, there's a faculty member up there as well. Tom Top Gun Cavesi is not still a resident, surely. Well, they're all guilty of incomplete feedback, either receiving or giving it. In our new curriculum, you have the opportunity to become an academic advisor. This is critical to the success of our new incoming residents. And you'll be able to advise according to a clear system and work closely with your resident trainees. You'll be knowledgeable regarding the assessments and the stages, and you'll be able to keep residents on track with the completion of their EPAs. Toby will speak a little bit more to the coaching model, but if you're wondering about the value of coaching, I'll just remind you of John Herdman and his inspirational coaching of our women's soccer team to a bronze medal in the Olympics. There will be added opportunities for assessment for the frontline faculty members as well, even if you're not an academic advisor. This paper is a six year follow up of a CBME orthopedic residency training program in the Netherlands. There was an excellent response rate, as you can see to the survey, and there was significant improvement noted in supervision and coaching by the residents who completed the survey. Queen's University, went as one to competence-based 
medical education in 2017, all of their programs transitioned. And this is the experience from the medical oncology training program. So if you were worried as a faculty member about how many EPAs you might have to complete, only 16 were completed on average by faculty over an 18 month period. Hopefully we can do more, but it's not as bad as it sounds. Of those assessments, 57% contained next steps or constructive feedback that were very useful for the residents. It's only fair to present all of the Queen's data. This was a survey of all of the programs to faculty and residents about their perceptions of the CBD rollout. 82% overall, both faculty and residents did feel there were positive benefits, although faculty opinion was actually more positive than residents. And residents after one year of rollout actually did not perceive improvement in quality of feedback. So that's an opportunity for us to think about our feedback as we move along. Now, there's one more mug who's not been guilty of anything. And of course, it's Sandy, who's obviously too nice. Next slide, Sandy. So this review by an international collaboration of seasoned CBME collaborators highlights the difficulties inherent in our current assessment systems. There are problems with ratings. They don't mean anything. What exactly does above average mean? What does meets expectations mean? And the difficulty that faculty have with rating a student or resident as anything less than, to be honest, above average, excellent, outstanding. We all come with biases and judgments in our evaluations. Some are conscious, some are unconscious, and not all of them can be controlled. So the solution proposed is that assessment should move more to low stakes assessment. Next slide, Sandy. Whereby one can do one assessment at one moment in time. This helps with the biased judgment piece because in the new curriculum, in order to be signed off as competent, a resident will need several assessments of any one EPA. And so that will mitigate the bias of each singular evaluator. These are formative assessments. The entrustability scale that is used, that is on the next slide, is more meaningfully applied by faculty and more meaningfully understood by faculty and residents alike. Faculty are more likely to use the whole rating scale. It's more likely that faculty will write one next step comment on the evaluation. Now, we still do need summative decisions and a holistic view of the resident's performance. Those are not made by the frontline faculty. They're made at the competence committee and program level. This is the O score in trustability scale. So as you can see, it's really about what the faculty member felt they had to do while the resident was doing the activity. And so much easier to provide a one, a three, a five, for example. Finally, for any number of reasons and factors, these residents, of which these three are only a representative group, and thank you very much to all of the residents and to Dr. Kavesi for providing their photographs and giving permission for us to use them. But residents as a whole find it difficult to ask to be observed. This paper, in the next slide, is a critical discourse about the naysayers uh, and the reasons for CBD failing. So there are some barriers cited for workplace-based assessment, discord between faculty and resident intentions, some social expectations that residents should be responsible and solely responsible for ensuring that observations occur. And obviously we all have competing demands for time. Next slide. This critical discourse analysis paper also states that one of the more common oppositions to competence-based education and CBD not working is that the responsibility for the assessments must and should only be that of the learner. Well, that's actually not true. Time has borne out and we know that this should be a shared responsibility for both learner and faculty with both of us asking for observations alike, faculty and residents. 
And this is a nice segue, this slide into Toby's piece, because this graphic is usually used to explain the concept of a growth mindset. And Toby's gonna speak about how we can grow and move forward into our new CBD world. Thanks, Hillary. So as you can see, it's not a question of whether we move forward with this, um, but how we wanna look at making it work and personalizing it to our own site. And this slide is just to highlight that, um, you know, we're part of a global movement in regards to adopting CBME. As you can see from this uh, interesting paper from Colombian anesthesiologists who clearly have had um, some ongoing interactions with our Canadian based medical educators about the CBME. Uh, the CBD rollout. And we're quite lucky to have multiple CBD experience faculty at our site to act as resource people as we move forward um, with um, the pediatrics, which is the largest program at our trading site of um, 57 residents, including NOSM. And in Canada, 28 programs have already launched since 2017. Shout out to Anesthesia and ENT, and then of course, um, all of Queens for being the first. Um, and then there's nine launching this year in 2021, including pediatrics. So there's a great opportunity just to collaborate and learn together. We also need to acknowledge that the, the moment of time that we're in. Healthcare is currently in a worldwide period of disruptive change. And I don't need to tell you this because I think we're all feeling it. And although COVID has added some additional excitement to CBD rollout, let's be honest, we all know that it would never have felt like a good time to implement a change of this size. But luckily at here at CHIO, we have had lots of practice in the last few years of adapting to change. And so it's a great opportunity for us um, to sh shape the implementation at our site together. And we've gotten through some tough things together. So we have some good experience with embracing challenges. Okay. To be fair, we haven't actually destroyed a galactic battle station, but there's nothing like a global pandemic to keep things in perspective. I think we can probably handle filling out a few things on an app. So what's actually really exciting about CBD is how this can impact not just on our training program, but on how we see ourselves and our work. So uh, Hillary alluded earlier to the growth mindset, and I'm sure many of you have already heard about it. Um, and uh, this is something that Carol Dweck, who's an American psychologist at Stanford, um, elaborated. And she studied the relationship between children's and adults' belief sets uh, and their understanding about the underlying nature of ability and performance. And uh, this is um, something that's been widely adopted, in particular in high-performance athletics. And for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to check Carol Dweck out on uh, TED Talks, um, the basic tenet is that rather than failure, lack of achievement is seen as not yet. And her findings from her research showed that we achieve our full potential and our best results by transforming the meaning of effort and difficulty. So this is something that she refers to as building the bridge to yet. So to give you an example of from one of her studies, um, she did a study where she had two groups of 10 year olds and gave them had a group of 10 year olds and she gave them a problem that was too difficult for them and then interviewed them afterwards about their experience. And following the interviews, um, there was a group of 10 year olds who said things like, I love a challenge and I was hoping this would be informative. Um, and this exemplifies um, children who have a growth mindset, where they believe that intelligence and results develop through effort. On the other hand, there were also children who said things like, um, they would cheat the next time, they would find someone who did worse than they did to make themselves look or feel better, or that there was a problem with um, the question. And this is what uh, she describes as the fixed mindset, where the belief is that intelligence is a stable characteristic, and if you make a mistake, it then indicates a lack of ability. So I probably don't need to tell you based on this who ultimately showed better, um, um, better performance and re resiliency. So she argues that adopting a growth mindset approach, even in situations of chronic poor performance can lead to remarkable improvements. And this has gone forward to be shown um, with some really remarkable um, results in grade school students, for example, in the lowest performing quartiles in schools and low income neighborhoods in the United States. Um, who have risen to having the highest grades and achievement on standardized statewide exams through adopting a growth mindset in the classroom. 
And there's ongoing work from her colleagues in performance monitoring, um, suggesting that neurons in the brain form stronger connections if there's an effort, and that adopting a growth mindset leads to superior improvement, af uh, improvement and accuracy after mistakes and receipt of feedback. So I have to be honest with you, I am not a psychologist, so I honestly feel I have limited ability to critically appraise this literature when I'm reading through it. But I think as educators and learners, um, we can acknowledge that um, this has some meaning for us in the context of what we're trying to implement here. And I think we could all see how in our current moment, the four key features of the growth mindset can really benefit us both as teachers and as learners. So effort is seen as useful. Challenges are something that you lean into and you embrace. If you make a mistake, it's an opportunity. And if you receive some feedback, you want to appreciate that feedback and then do your best to implement it. And I think we can all acknowledge that, you know, this is a best day kind of thing. And we're not all going to have growth mindset about all things every day. But I, I would certainly say that it's something for us um, to strive for. And the key to success for our site within CBD will be breaking down some of the artificial separations that exist between residents and faculty and how we picture ourselves, just recognizing that we're all colleagues on different stages of the competency curriculum. So I've given you an example here of a lifelong learner from respirology who was well recognized both for his clinical expertise, um, his research, as well as his teaching excellence. And personally, I can attest that he's taught me a lot over the years and he still teaches me things, but he also still has his own personal learning goals. And so it's important for us to remember that we're all one group. We're just on different stages of um, the competence curriculum, the competence continuum, excuse me. I think the hardest part of the growth mindset, though, is being honest with ourselves and with each other. So one of the arguments behind the move to CBD was the concept of failure to fail. And this is a lack of willingness of clinical supervisors to report on poor performance. So in their 2005 paper, uh, Nancy Dudek and colleagues identified four major barriers to reporting performance issues with trainees when they had concerns. The first is a lack of documentation. The second is a lack of knowledge of what to document. The third is anticipation of an appeal process. And the fourth is a lack of remediation op options. And what this highlights for me is that CBD represents a cultural shift where we're moving from trying to document what hasn't been done to trying to document what has been achieved, moving from the not yet and the bridge to yet. And as teachers, this is gonna mean for us shifting to a coaching mentality where the coach acts as a guide for learners through a process with the shared goal of enhancing performance. So these regular low stakes workplace-based assessments will provide a more robust, reliable and valid assessments and better preparation for independent practice. There's a number of different models that have been elaborated that all come with their uh, catchy acronyms for effective coaching. So Whitmore's coaching model is not specific to medical education, but it identified four steps for effective coaching. And you've probably heard of this one. Um, grow is the mnemonic. So articulating goals, reflecting on reality, describing the options for learning and deciding on a plan. So what is the W? And medical educators took this um, model and then described four phases in the R2C2 model for assessment of discussions specifically for medical learners, um, rapport and relationship, reactions to feedback, content to the feedback, and coaching to identify gaps. One of the critiques though of this model is that um, the, the way it's described, it's certainly very time intensive and that may be limiting in some settings. So in their 2018 paper, Bannister and colleagues looked at a number of different models and proposed the coach model you see on this slide. So initially you're going to contract the learner, orient, explore goals and establish, uh, establish an agreement on roles and expectations. You're gonna optimize. So you wanna set things up to observe and coach, um, act. You wanna make sure that the learner is aware of performance issues ensure that the goals are appropriate and make sure that the plan to get them to their goal is solid and reasonable. And C is check in, um, checking in with the learner. Are they implementing these plans, um, outcomes, and does something need to change? 
Now, ultimately, any of these are potentially effective. Um, the key is engagement of the commitments of both learners and faculty, and the importance of um, faculty and learner development to learn how to develop these coaching skills. And so there's also a very nice paper by Orr and all called Coaching by Design published um, in 2019. And this is something that we've committed to as our site is to have with our academic um, coaches to try and academic advisors to try and develop some of those coaching skills that we're all going to need both uh, residents as they progress to become faculty and evaluate more junior learners and as faculty. I think it's important to acknowledge that there's certainly ongoing theoretical debates about the evidence to support the change to CBD. And I would say uh, a fair critique about the potential for a publication bias. Some of the critiques have centered around um, the lack of financial support for a change of this mag magnitude and the potential negative impacts of increased demands on both faculty and learners for the documentation. In her 2010 paper, Susan Swing summarized some of these concerns. And one of the pieces that she raised was that, CB, that uh, CBME is a reductionist view of what are actually very complex integrated capability. And the, the outcomes would be dependent, very dependent on individuals, learners, motivation, and self-regulation skills. So more than ever, I think we need to be mindful of the coaching piece and the growth, the growth mindset that we bring um, to the work that we're doing. But let's keep our eyes on the horizon and take on a moment to acknowledge that there's actually a lot of evidence coming out about what actually works. Um, and there's been a number of studies that have looked at um, validity assessments. So locally, Goft and Dudek and all have published about their O score that Hillary alluded to earlier as a workplace test workplace-based assessment tool. And there's additional publications more recently by Holm and all looking at the O score and evaluating OSCEs. There's also some very interesting recent publications from the United States, um, large data set from Stan Hanster and all who used to be here in Ottawa, if, for those of you who remember him, looking at uh, validity assessments from competence committees. And then also um, some very interesting work by Schumacher and all that was published in 2010 in JAMA Network, um, looking at the uh, construct relevant variants in the EPAs. So good news, I would say, um, from that study, which looked at almost 2,000 residents and 20, more than 25,000 EPAs, um, it would seem that there's good evidence to support the using uh, EPAs as an assessment uh, framework. Where there's room for improvement is that out of the 17 um, general pediatric EPAs, this is a US study, um, the residents were only able to reliably achieve nine out of the 17 during the course of their training, which is shorter in the United States. On the plus side, though, up to 89% for the ones where they did progress quickly progressed faster than expected uh, through the training. So I think this kind of data coming out will be really important to inform um, how we're moving forward and looking at how we use these um, assessment tools. So this slide, though, that I wanted to study that um, Hillary mentioned earlier is really worth highlighting. And it's a really nice practical study from Warren Chung and colleagues um, in the Emerge here in Ottawa looking at CBD implementation. So they did um, essentially 25 interviews, 12 residents, 13 faculties from 10 different specialties. And they looked at sort of different domains um, from the interviews to identify barriers and enablers to EPA completion. And what they really wanted to explore here was some of the residents' ambivalence about being observed and the tension that exists between the teaching and the service obligations um, in a culture that really max values maximizing efficiency. And unsurprisingly, there were difficulties um, in reconciling heavy workflows and competing demands. But one of the things that they found is um, if you deliberately protect the time, you can set up structures, for example, teaching shifts for fa faculties, um, if you use some of the tools that are provided, and then also I think in the future, one of the things we'd like to look at is non-physician uh, or faculty observers. Um, there's still lots of ways to enable uh, successful EPA completion. So we are going to need to think um, going forward within each of our different practice milieus, how we want to ensure that this, uh, these activities are going to be embedded in our workflows. 
And I just want to say that, although it can seem overwhelming, getting EPA signed doesn't have to be hard. If faculty and residents just follow some very short four steps, it can be like one, two, three EPA magic, like they just appeared. So ask in advance, plan for the assessment or the observation, make sure that both faculty and resident have read the EPA and they understand what it is that's being assessed, and then document using the app in real time. And ta-da, as Hillary pointed out, eight minutes if you're a neurosurgeon, maybe 10 for a pediatrician. And the other thing I would like to remind everybody here is that we don't need to have this perfect by July. So our plans for the first stage, we're going to be setting up an EPA. Uh, we've got the EPA challenge coming up, thanks to our amazing and engaged uh, residents, and really look forward to having you join us on that. We're going to have an EPA boot camp as part of our new um, onboarding period for the new residents. Um, we'll be recruiting academic advisors, and we're, we are already working with education leads to try uh, and help relook at the curriculum and develop rotation and curriculum maps to modify them as we progress towards the new curriculum. Something else that's really important for us to remember is that during the overlap period, we really need to make sure that we ensure that the needs of our current time best cohort and the new CBD cohort are equally considered. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for the time-based cohort to also benefit from um, the use of the CBD model. And they're gonna get well acquainted because very shortly they will be faculty um, evaluating residents using this model as well and teaching. At giving that, um, we're all going to be part of this together. We're very excited to have you take a part in the upcoming CBD challenge. There's also some very exciting developments coming our way um, in regards to how we look at um, metrics using program analytics. So on the left, what you can see there is the current Elantra dashboard of EPA completion which as you can see, um, gives you some nice graphics about where people are at and how they're progressing um, from their training. And there are some um, folks in the University of Saskatchewan um, and specifically Dr. Brent Toma, who've taken this one step further and created um, a much more comprehensive program analytic dashboard that includes faculty EPA completion and larger program metrics. And the University of Ottawa um, has jumped on this bandwagon and will be implementing this dashboard at our site locally um, planned for most likely the fall of 2021. And this gonna, is going to allow us a much more comprehensive look at uh, both learners and faculty completion um, of EPAs. There's definitely a lot of information out there uh, about competency-based medical education. So at times it can feel like drinking from the fire hose, um, but a few key resources I wanted to highlight um, for you to consider looking at if you're interested in learning more. Um, the key literature in medical education podcasts or key line from the International Clinician Educator Group. Uh, it's, uh, you can get, find it on podcasts or you can find a link on the Royal College website, um, as well as lots of materials on the Royal College um, site. And you can see on the page there, um, number of presentations available um, for people to use um, other materials, templates for programs um, that are really helpful. And of course, you know, we need to acknowledge that as both of these sets of resources are coming from the purveyors of CBME, um, who are heavily invested, um, there's a potential bias in regards to some of the materials and the medical education, but I would say that there is still plenty of helpful, practical and interesting resources to be found. So in summary, I think what uh, Sandy, Hillary, and I wanted you to take away from today's talk is that CBD is a normal developmental concept. And we really understand this um, as pediatricians. We know how to do this. EPA completion does not need to be hard. Remember my one, two, three magic and the EPA will just appear. You can use SIM where needed. There's a lot of opportunities for development um, as well for other types of observers, lots of options and future things coming down. Um, so think about other ways of doing assessments. And finally, the thing to keep in mind, it doesn't have to be perfect. We are looking um, both in how we look at ourselves and our learners as, you know, if things aren't going well, we want to adopt that growth mindset. And sometimes the answer is 
not yet. So I think uh, I will leave it there and um, open the floor for um, any questions or discussion. So thank you all for a really excellent overview of uh, where we're going. And uh, I really want to thank you all for your uh, uh, tremendous uh, leadership uh, of uh, this area and taking it forward uh, for all of us. Um, clearly, there's a, a huge amount of work that's been done. There's still a, a huge amount of work to do. And, uh, uh, and you're focused uh, heavily on making sure that uh, the, the process rolls out smoothly. I guess my question relates to, uh, you know, you've presented a lot of literature, a lot of interesting studies that have been done uh, in the area. And I just wonder, this, this clearly represents uh, an opportunity for scholarship for those in education. And uh, are there particular projects that are going to be aligned uh, with, uh, with the rollout and uh, uh, specific questions that are going to be addressed along the way? So I think most of our effort uh, right at this moment is just to get us up and running from a pragmatic point of view. And um, that is uh, where we're moving towards for July. Uh, once we've rolled out, I think there obviously is opportunity to sort of study this uh, to a greater degree, especially in the context of pediatrics um, and especially in our center. So we'll be looking for those opportunities and we welcome uh, anybody who is interested in a particular question uh, to step up uh, and approach us and we would be happy to facilitate that. Hillary? Yeah. There, um, actually, that's a good question, Kieran. In fact, the mentorship challenge that our residents are piloting, uh, it would be really excellent if, a, if an incoming or interested resident wanted to kind of do a retrospective review of that after it's happened uh, to see if it does work as an incentive, because certainly something like that's not mentioned in the literature. One of our previous residents, Ashley Yang, she actually looked at when she was here as a resident, she looked at the problem of not using patients enough for assessments, so patients and caregivers. Uh, and so actually in the non-COVID era, there is a follow-up study to that that we would be hoping to get off the ground with regard to uh, that was that was program directors' perspectives about it, looking at family perspectives uh, about their involvement in assessment, and moving forward with some more scholarly work about involving caregivers in assessment. Thanks very much, Hillary. Because clearly, yeah, this is a tremendous opportunity and a great opportunity for for residents to be engaged in. Uh, uh, in scholarly work, and I, I, I think it's uh, it, it's got to be uh, encouraged. So it's uh, it's nice to hear that. So uh, open it up to the floor for questions, comments. Uh, there is lots of time. So Chris. Thanks. Um, the great presentation. And as you all know, I'm a fan of education. Um, I'm wondering, given that Queens went to CBD a few years ago, um, are you able to reach out to them to see um, what they had more difficulties with, uh, what novel ways they uh, approach different assessments, or was their CBD plan different than what is being rolled out with PEDS now? I can start with that one, but Hillary could also um, probably speak to part of it. And so in some of our pre-implementation preparations, um, Kirk Lisa, who's the pediatric program director, has of course been critical, has been to a number of our faculty um, workshops and retreats um, to sort of talk practically about some of the um, some of their experiences. And then the entire national CPPD group of flight like, program directors across the country are meeting regularly, sharing resources, um, looking at ways, what's working, what's not, keeping in mind that all of our sites and the way things are structured are a little bit different. And so I would say there's definitely been some good learnings to come from Queens. Their program size and structure is a bit different than ours. And so I would say that 
implementation piece is maybe not as translatable um, as perhaps some of the other programs that are set up a little bit more similarly to ours. But of course, definitely lots of um, great tips and tricks and wisdom uh, coming from uh, coming from Kirk and his colleagues um, at Queen's. So great thought. Hillary, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, yeah, um, a lot of what Toby said is how I would answer it too, Chris. Uh, I guess one, two things about, about Queen's. So they, of course, did not have the pediatrics EPAs available to them at the time. And so they had to develop their own rubrics, so which they did amazingly well. Um, but, you know, maybe a little bit of a different context just by that reason. One thing that Queen's did, which was actually fantastic and is actually advocated for in the literature, is hired an education consultant. So, you know, actually a <clears throat> PhD educator who kind of oversaw their rollout. Um, so we don't have that, but, uh, you know, it might be something that we might find might be useful as we move forward uh, when we see kind of how this works and what are, um, what are our successes and what are our challenges. And there's also opportunity to learn from all the other programs that are currently at U Ottawa. Um, we are almost smack dab in the middle, I guess, in terms of the rollout. Um, and there's lots and lots of support from PGME as they've learned over various programs as to what works, what doesn't. And some of that has obviously been passed down from program to program. And also uh, in terms of how PGME supports CBD as it rolls out. I do want to highlight that Vivian has uh, put in uh, the chat, the Google Sheet, to encourage uh, everybody to sign up uh, for a, the CBD Challenge team. And so um, if you could all uh, click on that link uh, and then please sign up. The residents would be very happy to have a lot of engagement. Other questions, uh, comments? I don't see much in the chat. I don't see any blue hands. Anybody who can't put up a blue hand who wishes to just speak up and ask a question, you're most welcome to do so. So I don't uh, see anything. I would just, uh, I guess we'll draw it to a close and say thank you very much to, uh, to all of you. Really look forward to uh, the rollout and uh, and uh, want to encourage all of our faculty members to, to support this in the best way possible and to uh, listen to the guidance of uh, those who are leading the way. And, uh, and, and I guess there's going to be the opportunity, you know, along the way for people to be able to reach out and, uh, and get um, instruction if they're struggling. Uh, can you speak to uh, maybe how, uh, you know, if, there are, if people are having challenges uh, completing their evaluations or whatever, what, what should they do? Yeah, so absolutely. Right now I'm in the process of reaching out to every division. So I'm hoping to meet with at least the educational lead so that they can support their division members or to meet with the entire division themselves. Um, the CBD workshops uh, continue to run. So if you uh, want another refresher or you know, how do I do this? Uh, those are still running through this month and through the month of June. And then as we sort of roll out in July, um, the three of us, uh, Toby, uh, Hillary and myself, uh, of course are available for any questions. Uh, for me in particular, I will be concentrating a lot of effort to support any faculty and any residents um, who are struggling either with the program or knowing how to do workplace-based assessments um, in a real way. And what I would encourage um, the faculty and the residents is to really concentrate on the comments. The comments are what's going to help the competency community make the decisions that they do as the residents, uh, as this first cohort of residents move through the different stages of training. Um, the little radio buttons that are there in terms of, um, you know, where they are will default to in progress unless you choose to move the radio button. Uh, but even without moving them, you can tell, uh, you can really sort of uh, convey your idea about where that resident uh, may be excelling or struggling in the comment itself. Uh, the mandatory part of those assessments is that O score assessment, the one to five score, moving from I had to start, jump in and do it for the resident 
to I could have left the resident um, to do it independently. So I think maybe Hillary, you can talk to the Competence Committee just for a few minutes about what you're looking for. Yeah, so certainly very helpful to have lots of completion of EPAs. Uh, and definitely Elantra provides us with fairly good data, uh, sort of as an overview. But in terms of providing meaningful feedback to the resident to help them with understanding what they need to do to continue in that stage, to move forward to the next stage, etc. Even just one or two sentences for next steps, you know, we would call that feedback for improvement. That is even a little example of just a quick piece of coaching feedback that can be provided to the resident in that assessment. That is very helpful for the competence committee um, to really be able to provide something more fulsome to the resident. And if anyone is struggling to get on Elentra, please contact me, I'm happy to help you. Uh, if you've forgotten your 145 password uh, and username, which is the um, same access for Elentra, uh, you can contact me and I'll get MedTech to fix it or you can contact MedTech yourself and get them to fix it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll draw to a close and uh, good luck with uh, all of your work.